Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piskor. And I'm Tom Scholey. We're going to look at the best of Ernie Bushmiller's Nancy today. Uh, but before we dive into this classic comic strip, Ed, tell us about Red Room. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in the Red Room universe, Jimmy. And two issues are on the stands as we speak. Every issue completely self-contained. Uh, you can see the, the Nancy reader out there will get a lot out of Red Room comics. A lot of crossover. <laughs> uh it's kind of Nancy-esque, <laughs> simple-wise. New, new issues come out every four weeks. Uh, you can order and pre-order those at your local comic shop or from the Fantagraphics website in the link tree in the description below this video. Or uh, hit up my Patreon, patreon.com slash headpiscor, three bucks for the archive there. And you can uh, read the comics before they, before they hit paper, over 100 pages. Uh, we're into serializing a fifth issue up there as we speak. I always think that we should flag these ahead of time and just do the the, uh, the screen the yeah. screenshot pages. <laughs> the YouTubers inspire the comments in the chat room. Tom, how about you? Um, I have Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. It's uh, the biography of Jack Kirby done in the comic book form. Uh, I also have Fantastic Four Grand Design. And uh, on Patreon, I'm uh, putting up my new comics as I work on them. Just search my name, Tom Scholey, on Patreon. And um, I have a YouTube channel called Total Recall Show. You can join me on patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, or you can download out-of-print zines and mini-comics. I just posted this Street Angel sketchbook from 2013. Uh, you can also see a lot of my original art. You can see scripts. Basically, the process that I make comics is a lot of what I put on my Patreon. So if you're a maker or if you're a fan of my work, patreon.com slash Jim Rugg is where to go. But the story today is... Ernie Bushmiller's Nancy. This is a kind of a cool book, and it's one of those, whenever uh, they would do these formats, you know, I think of Farside and, and Calvin and Hobbes, but they must have printed enough of these that you can always find them at a reasonable price, For sure. which is awesome. Uh, it's a good way to introduce you to the character, to the strip, and the nice thing with this book is there's a lot of information on uh, Bushmiller. You know, it's kind of, uh, as you go through these chapters, I mean, they cover, you know, 50 years of him doing this strip. So you get a, an overview of his life and career, little bits of biography. Uh, written by Brian Walker, maybe Mort Walker's son, not, I, not sure. I love that he's also uh, in, in Connecticut, probably. Everybody in that, is. In, in that comic strip <laughs> town. I saw Bill Griffith's name in there earlier, and he lived you know, a few doors down from Bushmiller. Fantagraphics uh, was across the street from Bushmiller for a time. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Uh, you know, it's like that mythical like Hicksville or something yeah. in Connecticut where all the cartoonists live. And uh, Nancy, you know, for anybody watching this channel that's coming from Rob Liefeld and Wizard may not be that familiar with Nancy, it's almost, uh, it's almost a math equation or something, the way it's, it's built. You know, no extra lines, no extra information. Uh, it becomes a gag series very early on, you know, each day, just a short gag, almost like a joke. And uh, I guess we'll cover the background first to, to evolve to that point. Miller, uh, Bush Miller was interested in becoming a cartoonist, got a job in, you know, these editorial rooms as, as like the big newspapers would have those things or the big syndicates would have those. And a lot of cartoonists would work and come out of there and rubbed elbows, got to be friends with various cartoonists like Milt Gross was one of his uh, early mentor types, even followed Milt Gross to Hollywood for a year where he continued cartooning, but also writing um, for Hollywood didn't like that, wanted to do the comics full-time, comes back to uh, the East Coast, and basically falls into Fritzy Ritz, which yeah. is the mm -hmm. the strip is about a flapper, and uh, Nancy is the niece that shows up after several years and uh, pretty soon becomes takes over the strip. Yeah, like the Fonz. Yes, exactly. Or like Popeye. I was thinking Popeye. <laughs> theater, but, uh, okay. Yeah, let's keep this on the comics page, Tom. Now, did you guys read Nancy when you were kids? I like, did. I did. Paper? Yeah. It, it was in the Pittsburgh paper, and it. Uh, I, I'm quite sure Bush Miller was not the guy. You know how these strips go. Uh, yeah, I think he bows out in the 80s. Well, in the early it 80s. It would have been the, the 80s. 80s. Uh, so... Nancy was one of the most perplexing strips and all the funnies for me because, to be honest, I didn't even know what she was. I didn't know that that's supposed to be a human little girl to begin with. It's, it's got a black helmet with spikes on it. Even when she first shows up, it's very abstract. You yeah. know, like, these are early appearances, and you can see, like, Fritzy Ritz looks like a, a woman. I, I guess, like, it's like a Nancy riff looks on... Nancy strange. Is Nancy supposed to be, like, a riff on Annie at this point, maybe? I don't know about that, um, but, if, but possibly. If Annie and Dondi had a, had a kid, <laughs> it, would be, uh, it would be Nancy. But uh, to, 
to me, the way uh, these Nancy strips work, uh, they're one of the few uh, daily strips that really do work their best when you read a gang of them at once because you have to like get into Bushmiller's rhythm and, and his mindset, man. And when you read a, a handful of them, it's the same qualities as like Ogden Whitney comics or even Fletcher Hanks to a certain extent where you're just getting like you're getting immersed in this weird world that right. where, where he's setting up the rules and some of this stuff like the jokes like ring a bell so that I know when to laugh <laughs> you know what I'm saying well yeah because it was in the paper I read it too and it was just like another comic like it didn't even register you know there was like Henry there was just all these weird comics and I wouldn't have given it a thought and then like years later like in, like in like the 90s or whatever it was like Scott McCloud and a lot of like the 90s cartoonists were kind of like uh, obsessed with Nancy and would sort of point out the uh virtues of it and so that's when I you know gave it a reappraisal and got you know caught up in that like 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 I I I love Nancy now mm -hmm. you know you could tell that this is early period because on the wall uh there there are um more than three bricks yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So he changes in 1938. He, he changes it over to Nancy and Milt Gross. You know his old friend. He remembers telling him, "Your future is with that little girl," yeah. um, which you know speaks to the whole the Popeye kind of thing of like this character shows up and it's where his imagination and interests go. And uh, and you're right about those early early pages, Ed. This is getting into the late 40s now. Whenever it feels like that's what's considered like his. I don't know, coming into his own, coming yeah. into, you know, maturing as a strip, kind of figuring out this kind of almost visual puzzle, right? Yeah. Where anything can happen in a comic strip. Three photographs. Good good call. Yeah, We're going to get to that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah four, four photographs would be too many. Two <laughs> wouldn't be enough. Now, like, that, that answers a question for me about, like, why Aunt Fritzy always looked like she was drawn in a completely different totally, style. Totally, totally. Yeah, very much a legacy of, like, the original you know, the original uh, creator probably. And they talk about some of his approach and it was a very conscious decision on his part that this was a mass medium and that I don't think they use lowest common denominator, but it's definitely geared towards towards that gag, towards an easy understanding. Um, even if it's not maybe laugh out loud funny, it's easy to understand what you're seeing. When, when, when she walks upside down, you know, on the ceiling, we can all understand what we're looking at. It's a, it's a business that we, we really don't, understand because because we're not in it and when a strip is big enough it gets licensed overseas and those strips have to work in i don't know danish newspapers and and russian newspapers and stuff <laughs> so it has to be you know sort of evergreen material uh she can't sleep so her aunt tells her to think of something pleasant she thinks <laughs> of school blowing up and gets right to sleep <laughs> This is the kind of humor I think of with, with Nancy, right? She has she can't find the, the pair for either of her skates, so she has a nice skate and a roller skate. Just dumb. Dumb yeah. dumb would be the word, but I do love that. Problem them. solving. It's what you said, Ed, about like, I probably read this stuff more than almost anything whenever it's like grab something to read for five minutes before I fall asleep because it's so easy to just go in and read a page or two. And, you know, they are little mind games. There, there is the famous, I think it is a Scott McCloud line. Where he said it's 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 harder to not read Nancy than to read it. Yeah, yeah, that's a great line, and it's very true. And you do get sucked in when you see this kind of stuff because he plays with formal things. He's a good cartoonist, and uh, there is no excess. It's very easy if you see something that looks out of place, like a bunch of dots, you get sucked right in. Like, what is this about? And you see, he's paring down his bricks. We're not down to three yet, but it's uh, <laughs> we're, we're we're paring it down. <laughs> I feel like this strip is famous. I've I've seen that in a lot of places. Yeah, I think a lot of these, as Tom said, so many different people kind of championed Nancy. I thought about bringing some of those examples. You know, there's um, how to read Nancy. Yeah, it was Paul a recent uh, a recent book that came out. It was appeared in Raw magazine with some of those guys. You know, writing about it and deconstructing it, and and some of those excerpts are in here. But it is. I wouldn't say ubiquitous, but it's certainly been, uh, you know, featured in a lot of places, including painters and different people that were incorporating it. Andy Warhol did a did a uh, Nancy painting. She's reminded of teeth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and some of it just doesn't even make sense. You know, it's completely just a visual gag, I guess, that Bushmiller had in mind, came up with. Yeah, you talk about a puzzle. This, Yeah, this is making me think of, like, yeah, some kind of, like, Rubik's kind of thing. 
What what does a, a lonely lighthouse keeper do for amusement? <laughs> it's stupid. These kind of gags are fun. Meanwhile, I feel like I've seen Marvel comics that look like this. <laughs> <laughs> There's a big face in Ronin that looks that way. Yeah, very much so. <clears throat> and again, these chapter breaks are pretty nice for just giving a little bit of information about Bushmiller, who was very private. I don't know if he ever did an interview in his life. So a lot of this stuff is from, you know, neighbors, friends. This is very telling from the collection of Jerry Moriarty. Like, Jerry Moriarty, uh, Jack Survives is his uh, big uh, comic from, from a Raw magazine. He he was that early kind of, like, tastemaker guy in the Raw universe, man, because he put the, he put the team down with Fletcher Hanks, Jay Disbrow, Seeing his name right here, maybe he's the guy that cracked the code with Nancy, with with Spiegelman and all those dudes, Karasik and them. These kinds of collections, though, uh, a lot of the value really is in reading this back matter stuff. Yeah, definitely. Although I gen genuinely enjoy the strip. Yeah, like this yeah. is one of those best of both worlds because I do have those books where it's like I'm interested in the cartoonist, but I'm probably not going to read a hundred pages of the comic. Uh, but but this one's kind of an exception. I like both. Uh, yeah. Grant, Grant Morrison, yeah, Pax, Pax Americana. Americana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you see some of these, like, the formal exercises, Love you know, it, hanging right. on your panel border, like it's a line, looking behind the page into, like, the backside of that newspaper page. Sweeping dust behind the panels. <laughs> like, this is this is Harvey <laughs> Kurtzman spank material right here. <laughs> I, each one of these things was done in MAD. That's amazing. I, I really want to see what the copyright is. Okay, 51. Dude, it's before fucking MAD. The Mad Comic. Yeah, and this this chapter is credited as being mostly from Moriarty's collection, which is also something to note in that people used to have to, like, clip and collect and trade and save the strips from the newspaper, you know? Like, we didn't have these books whenever in, in, in the 50s or 60s. Like, for the most part, you had to just, uh, you know, love them and save them. It was super fun, man. We've, we've been to a couple studios. How about this? Where, yeah, man. <laughs> where, where guys had uh, just, like, a little shoebox with a date on a piece of masking tape of, you know, Nancy, April 1945 to blah, blah, blah. Can you imagine being the first cartoonist <clears throat> to be like... Prototype for how to read Nancy. The, the first cartoonist to be like, guys, you're going to think I'm crazy, but <laughs> I love Nancy. You know, and like the fear of like the beating he was going to... And then, me too! <laughs> That's a pretty classic type gag, you know, mm -hmm. total visual gag. Yeah, uh, that was that was in a Calvin and Hobbes. This is the breaking this this idea down, you know, like really looking at the mechanics behind Bushmiller's cartooning and how it worked and how simple some of these things were. Uh, and I assume I haven't read How to Read Nancy, the book. I've heard really good things about it, but I think it's just expanding these kinds of ideas, I would assume. I mean, this is this is like your working prototype, I think, for that book. But it's fun to see him go through, you know, Karasik and, and Newgarden go through all of the components and really look at, like, how simple it is, but also the magic behind that simplicity. And then these Sunday strips ran for a long time. Fritzy was still a Sunday strip for decades after, after it had become Nancy in the dailies. Like, let's unpack this, you know? <laughs> like, it's kind of a semi-normal-looking lady, and then this goofball. <laughs> you know what? There were some of these pages, uh, these, these Sundays at... Um, at uh, the Billy Ireland, <laughs> and uh, I got, we gotta just cut this. <laughs> Never mind. <clears throat> so, like I said, Bushmiller does this strip for I think forty something years, and it you know kind of this book chronicles all of that. Um, it so, comes out after he had died. So you see her becoming more and more codified as as we as we progress. Yeah. So, like you know, as a little dude. You know, I was down with Pac-Man, so I knew that if Pac-Man has a bow in his hair, that's a female. But for some reason, this didn't translate, you know? Like, that that was not hair to me. Yeah, Nancy's not, like, a cute little cartoon character. She She's definitely almost that, uh... I don't know, you could almost make an argument for her not even being human. That's you know? what I'm saying, she's like a little monster. Yeah, yeah. Especially whenever you just see, like, a close-up of her face yeah. or whatever. Hamburger. Hmm. And it helps that she interacts with people. Like, whenever Fritzy's in the same panel, it really punches home, like, how much she's different and other. These are fun classic comics kind of stuff, playing with the expressions. I 
I think uh, I used to read about Nancy and cartoonist take on Nancy and how generic it was. Mm -hmm. Like that would be a word that was used a lot and probably not something that everybody would value. And now I love that part. Yeah. Probably uh, like, like what would really be generic is if Nancy weren't repulsive. You know, like like a, like a cute version of Nancy would be generic. This is taking. Speaking a stand. of which, combo with Sluggo. <laughs> in, in case she wasn't unattractive enough, like there you go. Could be worse, Tom. I swear, Bush Miller looks like this in every picture, like across many decades. I think he always looked. He, he turned into this early and just <laughs> carried it to the grave. See, that's giving up the kayfabe, man, because. Uh, people at home they don't know that we we sit around in our suit and ties while we're shooting these videos yes exactly roll up my sleeves you know to really be able to turn these pages effectively we have to be every man you know like it's <laughs> we learned that from dusty roads take off the rolex watches <laughs> <laughs> these shoes are worth more than your entire house than your entire comic book collection <laughs> I want to get into some of the, uh, you know, like th this was a chapter on some of the licensing and stuff. Like Nancy was very successful. I think she was in around a thousand newspapers at the height of her popularity. I was thinking about it this week and trying to figure out like, what's the number of that? You know, did she have 10 million readers a day whenever you, whenever you break down all of this stuff to put it in context with what we think of as like a, a good selling comic book or, so, you know, a popular comic, like this stuff was so far beyond that. And Nancy was successful. It wasn't a, uh, you know, an artist, artist, no, so yeah. to speak. My in-laws have uh, have both read this book, my mother-in-law and mm -hmm. father-in-law, and that's the only comics of mine they've ever shown any interest in, you know, to speak to that idea of, like, this is lay people, you know, regular people would just read this and enjoy it for its comedic value, for whatever reason, but, you know, so not looking at it from a, from a craft standpoint. Right. And I think that's noteworthy, you know? I mean, I... I I often think like that's the one piece that I can't really speak to. I can't look at a comic and be like, "This is you know from an outside from a, from a reader's point of view." Like yeah. I can't look at this without seeing the craft in it. Sure, sure. Yeah, I always like like over your house. I remember your wife t like commenting when like a bunch of us were looking at something, and she's like, "Like I I don't have the I, like I I can't see what you guys see." Right. Yeah, she often says that, and you know my in laws would fit that bill perfectly. Uh, they certainly aren't looking at it like the way I am, but this is the, the piece that they pick up and look at. Yeah, so this is... Um, Bill Griffith. Exactly. And that's that's your classic, you know, rule of three, yeah. uh, playing with that. And this is, this is showing some of the, um, you know, other artists and their reactions to Nancy through these next several pages. So that's kind of cool to see Bill Griffith, a very thoughtful, you know, outstanding cartoonist, and seeing his ideas about... Uh, Bushmiller and Nancy. All those uh, mad parodies were real dope. They skinned that cat many ways, Jimmy. That's This is kind of fun. This gets into his idea, pictures worth a thousand words, and uh, you know, kind of where Bushmiller's coming from in terms of ideas. That daily strip is another one that I can't quite put, wrap my head around the idea of like doing something like this every day for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, Man, that's a certain kind of madness. You know, you're 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 developing some neuro pathways in your brain that no other human beings are going to have just, because it's such an extreme exercise. That Nancy face and the hair is probably like burned in his retinas. Oh, I, mean, yeah. it, I mean, this looks stamped out. You yes. know, like just rubber stamp these 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 images. Yeah, totally. And yet, still, he's finding ways to be visually inventive in almost mm -hmm. every strip. Yeah, like that's amazing. Reminds me of a Calvin and Hobbes, you know, thinking of uh, things that are way outside of the normal everyday life of this little kid. And you see, I mean, in, in every strip, there's there's a couple of things that are kind of off model and interesting and new. Yeah, like look at this for for a two panel strip. You get the roller coaster and an alien. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't know where it's from, it's a Martian. Dabbling in the editorial cartoon. This is pretty inventive. Sunday Sunday strip, I guess maybe. I was going to say a Halloween strip, but I don't know that that's what it is. Taking it to the place of Wolverton, now it's January. He, they, they point out like some of his interpretation of, say, modern art and abstract art, which seems to be a subject a lot of cartoonists yeah. play with and, uh, and fool around with, and he's no exception to that. And here you get to see uh, some different artists playing with, uh, with Nancy. This is your Warhol piece, so uh, native... Pittsburgh or 1961, you know, much more famous for things like Dick Tracy, but uh, also was looking at uh, Nancy as a subject. 
Carl Worsom, so from the Harry Who, yeah, so the Chicago cool. images, you know, again, playing with that idea of like, what is this code? You know, these things, they're not eyes, they're dots, they're lines. And then what can you do with it? A famous piece from Raw. Yeah, this is fun. This is, I think this is Mark Newgarden, but it's, it's printed out of order in this book. And so they have like this little insert that, uh, please read page 203 and then 200, 201, 202. So if you're, if you're following along at home, start here and go back. Bazooka Joe makes a cameo. Speaks to the flexibility of the uh, of the character that you can go that far. And here we go, getting into the, like the abstract painting, the uh, museum as a setting for I don't know target for their ire, the uh, uh, a place to po poke poke the fine art world a little bit. You know that's a, that's another time where like like let's look at that little Indisha piece and see if you know the Warhol stuff is coming out and selling for millions or something. <laughs> and you know Bushmiller has something to say about it. Yeah, I bet all of those guys saw that kind of stuff when pop art happened, and it was just, yeah. It's and I, probably I, a lot, quite a reaction from any cartoonist. I think the that. default setting for, like, humor comics is just to, like, shit on anything, any, especially something that has, you know, pretension built into it. A strip with fog. <laughs> he got some zips, man. Yeah. <laughs> he, he got some zips. Screen in, time. It, it had a week of uh, gray texture. These are great, funny mirror distortions. Yeah, it's they're, they're all um, despite the simplicity, as you say, Ed. Like every strip has some kind of visual inventiveness, which is really saying something, you know. Like we're getting into the late '60s on some of these strips, so that stuff stuck around for pretty much the duration of the strip. Shouldn't have eaten all that upside down cake. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and if um, if Nancy becomes any more abstracted, she would become you know type. She would become letters. She you know that that. Where, 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 like, pictures meet uh, symbols. Yeah. And then uh, the holiday cards. Cartoon is famous for doing uh, holiday cards. So you get to see some of that uh, kind of ephemera type stuff. And Bushmiller looking older here. I think he had Parkinson's towards the end. So he would work with assistants. He would kind of oversee and direct them the last several years. But he had certainly laid down enough examples for somebody to follow. Uh-oh, we got those aliens again <laughs> from the 60s, man. They're making a new appearance. I wonder if there are any people up there on Mars. Of course not. And then the Martians having the same idea about Earth. See, this is what happens when you do comic strips for so for so long. Uh, you start to draw, like, uh, bellboys like, <laughs> like, looking like that in the 70s and shit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I still draw dudes wearing Bosch jeans. <laughs> It's one of my favorite parts about uh, old comics is seeing, like, you know, they're period pieces now that we look at yeah. them, but hopefully they reflect the contemporary, what things looked like at the time. But you're right, it usually doesn't. Yeah. Cartoonists are locked in their rooms, <laughs> head down. They're not keeping up with it. That's it, man. Two black eyes, turns them into a panda. Just, just dumb visual gags. But kind of awesome. Rehearsing for whenever Nancy and Sluggo actually get married. Feel good wrap-up. So... A relatively uh, cheap entry point into Nancy, but a pretty good survey and probably about as much info as you're going to get on Ernie Bushmiller. Mm. And th the bummer of this is Fanographic starts reprinting these, and I guess the cells aren't aren't there, only only do like three volumes. And I guess that series is, I don't know, on hold indefinitely at this point. Yeah, Gary, Gary's pretty frank about that kind of thing, man. He was just doing an interview uh, fairly recently, and they were asking him, well, what about, you know, Bud Sawyer? He's like... Can't sell them. We can't sell them. That's why. Try as we may. Well, there's a lot of a lot of strips reprinted in here, so I would highly recommend it if anybody's curious about this comic strip, about this type of cartooning. You know, it's kind of intellectual, but it is still like the the dumb jokes. It reminds mm -hmm. me of reading like an old joke book, uh, almost like the corny uncle or something that would always have the funny the funny dumb joke. <laughs> right. uh, it's it's sort of the speed of this stuff, but just an exceptional level of craft and execution. Yeah, yeah. it's the high and the low. Yes. Yeah. Well said. You laugh and you shake your head at the same time. K favors like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jim, Jimmy, what's out there? Join me on patreoncom slash Rug, where you can download out of print zines and mini comics. You can see my original art, scripts, notes, basically how I make the comics I make on patreoncom slash Rug. Uh, read Jack Kirby: The Epic Life of the King of Comics and Fantastic Four Grand Design. Uh, check out my Patreon and uh, my YouTube channel, Total Recall Show. 
Red Room Comics in the Wild, two issues on the stands as we speak. New comics come out every four weeks. You can order, pre-order them at your local comic shop or the Fantagraphics website in the link tree in the description below. Or uh, read the comics on Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks for the archive there. I'm into serializing the fifth issue. Uh, and new strips come out every Tuesday. What else? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. All right, Jimmy, give them the marching orders. We're going to be on our way. Read more comics.